steampunk Mark Wimsel here to tell you about my $200 trip from Chihuahua back to La Paz, BCS, Mexico. But first, who is steampunk Mark Wimsel? Why, well, Mark Wimsel is a line on boats that tells cargo ships how much they can be loaded. It's turned into a hieroglyphic with uh, different lines for different oceans of salinity and wave height, I think. So why should you listen to Steampunk Mark Plimsoll? Well, um, besides a bachelor's degree in vertebrate biology and a minor in mathematics, I was raised atheist and I've had a lot of time to read about science and everything else. I was raised with an Encyclopedia Britannica. In fact, I was born in front of an audience. That's right, my father was going to medical school in Chicago and my mom volunteered to be an exhibit for the class. So there I was, I slid right out and the doctors had to apologize to the class because it was not a normal birth. My mother confessed uh, years later, decades later, that she could have given birth to her five children by going out and squatting in the woods. So that's steampunk Mark Plimsoll. Now while I was in kindergarten, the teacher thought I was retarded because I just sat there fairly inactive, which surprised my mother. So they had me tested, and it turns out it was more like a seven-year-old put in a cage full of monkeys, you know? And after all these years, sometimes it feels like not much has changed. So here I was, 22 years old, after living a life feeling jealous of the cats on my mom's lap because she could only give her affection to the seven dogs lying around in a semicircle at her feet. It was like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So I was a pretty depressed child. I got uh, tonsillitis from like 17 to 19 every time it rained. I'd get a fever and these huge growths on my tonsils. One time I was trying to call the doctor to make an appointment. And my mom wouldn't help me. And I said, well, just tell me how to find the doctor. And she says, look in the yellow pages. It's not here in the yellow pages. And she wouldn't tell me how to do it. Maybe she had forgotten. So I threw the phone book at her and that gave me a reputation of having a bad character. But really, she could have just turned around and said, look under physicians. How hard is that? So uh, when I graduated from high school, I took off hitchhiking that October through Minnesota to cross Trans-Canada 1, over to Vancouver, lived there for a while, went down to Seattle, lived there for a while. Went to San Francisco and Berkeley and lived there for a while. Hitchhiked out down to uh, San Diego and crossed the border into Mexico. That was like exciting with a couple of military guys, but didn't learn much. And then I uh, hitchhiked to New Orleans and surprise, surprise, there was my brother on the street with his friend. We met by chance. He had driven down in an old Volkswagen. So that's how I returned back to Michigan. So. Then at uh, 22 years old, after pondering how people in Guatemala could live on one dollar a day, I decided to hitchhike out to Guatemala. So I hitchhiked through the United States and crossed the border of Presidio, Texas into Okinaga, Mexico. And there I was with a couple of semesters of Spanish under my belt in a sea of black hair and brown skin, beautiful brown skin. And it hit me immediately. Where are all these people in the United States? I mean, this yellow fever idea, it's not going to stop at the border. And I knew we killed them. We killed them and moved them around and they ended up in reservations or you barely make a living. So I hitchhiked and took buses and trains through Mexico. But first, from Okinaga, I took a train with the intention of going through the Barranca del Cobre, the Copper Canyon in Mexico, with one of the world's great train rides, down to Los Mochis on the Gulf of, of California. Well, it's now called the Sea of California, I believe. It used to be called the Sea of Cortez, but they just dropped that name out of deference to the Indians, I guess. So, I, from Okinaga, I rode to Chihuahua on an old-fashioned train with wooden seats and cowboys and bags full of chickens and tethered goats. And then in Chihuahua, I took the train through the Taramara lands, of, uh, silver needled pines all the way down to Los Mochis through a grand canyon with vegetation from pine trees down to papaya trees in the tropical lowlands. 
I was really depressed. Going from Okinawa down into Chihuahua, I saw the Okatilla plants. They reminded me of cartoon drawings of grenades. And I just, that the world, it looked so strange and exotic. It was like landing on another planet, and it was really beautiful. So then I got um, through into Chihuahua, and from Chihuahua I took the El Chepe train through the highlands, crossing the Continental Divide seven times, said the literature, with 37 bridges and 82 tunnels, I believe. What a train ride, and here it is reproduced uh, because I just took it again 49 years later and this time with a camera. I didn't have a camera the first time. But the beauty of this ride kind of got me out of my depression. There were beautiful black-haired, brown-skinned people around me and this landscape which sort of reminds us of religious feelings, of, of soul and belonging and beauty and that's one of Maslow's uh, uh, evidence of uh, self-actualized people once they've met their needs for food, clothing, shelter, sex, uh, service to their community, membership in their community, and um, some sort of security. Why then they decide to devote their attention to the betterment of others because of this religious feeling that you get in nature with this beauty. Look at this place. So from then on, I felt pretty good about myself. I was alone in Mexico, couldn't even speak the language, but I belong to this place. This place is so beautiful and so comforting. Even rushing through it on a train, standing on a platform with the wind beating around you. The camera noise is amazing, so I tried to filter that out. So, what does this have to tell us today? Well, one of the things I noticed on this train is that the indigenous people could ride for about 350 pesos, which is like $17 or something. But they had this, but they were all in the last two cars where all of the trains heat accumulated. Um, why are trains so efficient? Because you only have the air resistance of one coach. It's not like every coach has got a windshield, just the first one. So it's like a tunnel of, uh, without wind resistance that this train slips through. And the Taramar Indians are so poor. And look at this place. This pretty much represents the 2% of land that they have not logged. They are still logging. They are still deforesting this area. But this area here where the train runs through is, I think, a bit too rugged. I don't think they're going to let them log the beauty of this pristine natural environment. It has a, a tourist class that does this train ride, but from Los Mochis going up only to Creel. It's um, more expensive. You can get off in three different places and stay for a day because the train will run through in your direction every other day. And um, it has observation cars and restaurants. Now the train I was on is called the Regional, which just is for local travel stops anywhere people need to get on or off. And it has a small snack bar. Two people um, doling out the snacks that are fairly horrible, processed, you know, shrink-wrapped, uh, like two meat burritos with a bean burrito and something they think is a corn tortilla, but it's some sort of a flour mixed with plastic or something. I don't know. But that wasn't very good. But they did uh, separate out three bean burritos for me, which is really nice because I'm a vegetarian. I've been vegetarian for 49 years since I went on the trip to Mexico because Mexico was vegetarian at the time. Indians were selling bean tacos on the street and throwing strange plants in it. So that made me a vegetarian. Now all of Mexico is carnivorous. You enter a restaurant and say, do you have vegetarian food? And they'll say, no. Do you have beans? Yes. Do you have tortillas? Yes. Do you have avocado? Yes. So they've completely lost track of their pre-Hispanic diet, which included amaranto, which has a pretty complete set of amino acids. You know, our bodies, our liver, makes 11 of the amino acids we need. It's really all we need to eat, amino acids. There's no such thing as protein. It's all going to get dissolved and eaten up by your digestive juices and acids in your stomach and intestines, the bacteria. So the amino acids, we make 11 of them, we need 9 more. Those are called the essential amino acids, which you can get a complete setup by 
eating a legume with a grain. Legumes are seeds that kind of drop, pull apart in half, like peanuts and beans and garbanzos and lentils, and a grain like a wheat or corn. So the corn and bean diet is a great diet. It avoids all the saturated animal fats and charring meat into strange carcinogens. Our ancient ancestor monkeys developed a taste for burned flesh so they could eat the dead animals they found, um, which they probably broke the bones of to get the uh, bone marrow out because it doesn't spoil as, well, as fast. So they char their meat, kill the bacteria and eat that. So we have this taste for charred meat. It's really not good for you. If you don't eat meat, all you need to do is make sure you eat enough vitamin B12. Now, if you look on any multiple vitamin, the vitamin B12 level is usually like off the chart, like 500% of your minimum daily requirement or 1,500% of your minimum daily requirement. So if you eat beans and corn or balance your amino acids without eating meat and take a multiple vitamin, why, you'll be maybe as healthy as I am at 70 years old. Well, at least this body is 70 years old. So, how did the third world stay so poor and the United States become so rich? Well, most Americans kind of underthink the idea that we fund 800 offshore military bases. Now, Combine that with the knowledge that America's 5% of the world's people consume 25% of the resources, and you start to have some suspicions. Now for global justice, for climate justice, do you really think electric cars are going to do anything but assuage our guilt for doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere? The United States is overwhelmingly responsible for injecting all that CO2 into the atmosphere. Two times the levels that previous to the Industrial Revolution had kept the climate stable for 10,000 years. How did we do that? By burning millions of years of fossils in about 200 years. So we've got this overloaded atmosphere, overloaded with carbon dioxide. So let's get that carbon dioxide out of there by stop fishing, stop eating animals, stop letting animals burp methane into the atmosphere. 95% of the USA's meat comes from these feedlots where they basically are concentration camps for our domesticated pets, which used to give us milk and wool and things like that. And now we're eating them. So if you take that 5% of the world's population consuming 25% of the world's resources and do a little math for global social justice, let's say, why, if 5% consumes 25%, then 10% would consume half the planet. It would consume the entire planet, and that's only a fifth of mankind, humankind, excuse me. We need four more planets for global social justice at the United States level of consumption. So here's the question. Tell me how much you would give up to keep the world from heating up. We've had a run through the global uh, uh, COVID-19 quarantine shut the world down for a while and things got healthier. The air cleaned up. Animals start coming back into the edges of the cities and suburbs. We could do that again. We could work from home. And within five miles, we should just bicycle. The United States has 70% overweight citizens, with 40% of those citizens, of all citizens, being obese, which creates 20% of the USA's healthcare costs. Those people need to get on bicycles. It is just silly to sit there on the couch eating salty, sweet, acidic foods. And why do we eat those foods? Because corporations have programmed us using the four flavors on our tongue. Well, especially the first three, salt, sugar, and acid. The third alkaline is sort of for poison detection. So by using our taste for burned meat, salt, sugar, and acid, the corporations have addicted the first world humanity into this crazy diet that leads to obesity and health problems. So bike within five miles. 
takes you 20, 30 minutes, almost the same as getting in your car and driving. And it gets you off the couch where you're sitting there with your exercising your thumb on the remote while you're ordering food to be delivered by Uber. You want to defund fossil fuels? Stop driving your car. A car costs $10,000 a year. Well, 50% of humanity is earning about $5 per day, which is just over $1,000 per year. But that doesn't stop them from seeing all the advertisements that tell them what kind of life most humans should have. All the consumerism, all the uh, crazy ads for cars and car services. Just drive down the street and look at the businesses related to cars. Count the parking lots, the tire stores, gasoline, auto parts shops. Uh, it's just endless. <laughs> Everybody's got to have a car, and it's one car per person in the United States. One fifth of the planet's cars are in the United States, and there's only 5% of the world's population. For global social justice, I asked the United States, tell me what you could give up to keep the world from heating up. Steampunk Mark Plimsoll. Bye-bye.